Protein is so critically important, especially as we are getting older. As a 52-year-old woman, I need more protein than I did 25 years ago. The lack of adequate protein intake is fueling our metabolic crisis. It's understanding that it is not so simplistic to, if you eat too much protein, if you eat too often, it's going to be too much growth phase in this mTOR activation. It is really so much more than that. It is poor metabolic health. It is insulin resistance. It is obesity. It is the lack of sunlight. It is the poor emphasis on stress management. It is the poor quality sleep. We have a disordered relationship with our bodies. We have a disordered relationship with our health. We have a disordered relationship with the scale. And that is fueled by this narcissistic troubling fixation on weight and I'm like weight is one part of the picture it's a very small part too and the scale I would say is a liar a damn liar for, especially for the menopausal women who will say I the, the scale is stuck I plateaued I can't lose weight I'm like well first of all how is your sleep because mm. the real issue is if I can't get you to sleep through the night I can't get you to lose weight so you're telling me Cynthia that there's all these factors that influence weight gain and weight loss, I thought it was as easy as just eating less and moving more. I know. <laughs> no? It's no. not that easy? No. No, and in fact, it's so funny that... Cynthia Thurlow, welcome back to the Keto Camp Podcast. I just looked it up. This is the fourth time I've interviewed you. It's amazing. So good to be here and be here in person in your new studio, which is amazing. Thank you. And it is the first time we've actually done this in person now. So th this one is going to be the best one yet. Uh, everybody in my audience knows all about you. My community adores you. My keto campers adore you and love you. They all told me to tell you hi during wow. our coaching call today. Uh, so if you want to go watch or listen to those previous episodes with Cynthia, we'll link that down below. I want to start the conversation with uh, protein. You know, there's still to this day so much confusion and misinformation regarding protein. Like being in the keto space myself, a lot of different viewpoints on protein. And if we would have had this conversation maybe three years ago, I would have said, we want to be really cautious with protein, you know, gluconeogenesis, it'll kick you out of ketosis. I have a completely different understanding with it. But what are your thoughts on protein this these days? What are your views on it? And what does the research show? Yeah. So I think the most important thing is most of you watching this podcast are not eating enough protein. And protein is so critically important, especially as we are getting older. I'll give you an example. So I have teenagers. My teenagers need a lot less protein to stimulate something called muscle protein synthesis, which means this activation in the body, you hit a certain leucine threshold. Leucine is an amino acid, which then stimulates mTOR, which is what allows you to kind of build muscle, right? It's the opposite of autophagy, you know, this waste and recycling process that goes on. As we get older, we actually need more protein, not less. So as a 52-year-old woman, I need more protein than I did 25 years ago. Mm. And so understanding that as we get older, we have to be more conscientious about protein, not just for maintaining lean muscle tissue as we're getting older and lean muscle tissue also equates with insulin sensitivity and when we're talking about what is it 92 93 percent of americans right yeah. now are not metabolically healthy Awful. this is something all of us need to lean into not to mention the fact protein is this incredibly satiating macronutrient and so the question always becomes how much protein mm -hmm. number one number two is i've been told i'm diabetic or insulin resistant and if i eat too much protein I get an insulin spike or I get a blood sugar spike. Yeah. You know, what do I do about that? And so I would say for the average person, and this includes everyone, 30 grams is the minimum we should be consuming at a meal. Mm. So, you know, you and I talk about how much we love beef jerky. And I know each one of those Paleo Valley beef jerky sticks is six grams of protein. And you better believe when I sit down, if I have one, like if I'm traveling and I'm just in a position where I'm hungry, I'm not able to get a clean meal. I know how many I need to eat to hit that threshold, or I need to eat that plus something else yeah. to hit that threshold. So if you really look at the research, and Dr. Don Lehman is the person that really was able to connect the pieces of you know, how much muscle, how much muscle protein synthesis, the combination of the leucine threshold, and understanding that we need more protein, not less with age. He was the person that kind of put all that research together with the activation of mTOR. But helping people understand that we shouldn't be fearful of protein helping people understand that protein is not just for muscle bros, that protein is something that we all need throughout our lifetime. And I would argue is probably one of the most important macronutrients. You know, we really think about like, what can we not get from anything else? We have to eat the protein. We mm -hmm. can't just make it on its own. 
And so when I am talking to women predominantly, it's helping them understand, like, I don't want you to be fearful of asking for an eight ounce steak. I don't want you to be fearful for asking for half a pound of shrimp or a certain amount of chicken, but get comfortable understanding what does that portion size look like? And how do I combine that with my, the other macros? You know, if you're having fats, like if you have a ribeye, you don't need more healthy fat in your meal. Right. If you're having a filet, you might be able to add some fat to your meal. But I think for many people, there's a lot of constellation of questions and concerns that come up around protein. Um, I, I think the biggest one is understanding you need enough. Like enough represents 30 grams. That's the base threshold. I'm sure, and I know, because I've eaten with you, I know that when I sit down to eat meals, it's 50 to 60 grams in a mm -hmm. meal. That's my minimum, my absolute minimum. That's have, your minimum. That's my minimum, and I can easily accommodate that. Now, that's not where I started mm -hmm. when this kind of started coming on my radar, but I can tell you as we get older, and, and certainly I can speak to women specifically, as we are losing estrogen in the latter stages of perimenopause and as high, you know, higher levels of follicular stimulating hormone, which is that hormone from the pituitary gland that's screaming to the ovaries to release an egg, which isn't going to happen. As that's happening, we start becoming more catabolic, which means we break down more muscle. So when I say it's so important as a woman and certainly as a man, although men's andropause is not as ca uh, catastrophic as mm -hmm. a woman's menopause, yeah. Um, really helping people understand that protein is the way. If you look at the longevity researchers, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably rattle some feathers when I say this. Do it. As much as I respect their work, they all look sarcopenic mm -hmm. and they look sick. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they grossly restrict their food. Because they to, hate mTOR. Right. And they don't eat sufficient amounts of protein. Mm. And so they don't look healthy. And in many ways, they look anemic and emaciated and sarcopenic. And sarcopenia is muscle loss with aging, which is not a question of if, but when. So for everyone to understand that after the age of 40, the process of muscle loss accelerates. You start losing strength unless you are working against it. And so one of the ways, one of the, the ways or the path to maintaining metabolic health, maintaining muscle mass as, you're older, as you get older is lifting heavy things, making sure you're eating enough protein, and a few other things, mm -hmm. but I would argue that the lack of adequate protein intake is fueling our metabolic crisis. Well, what a great way to start there. Let's uh, <laughs> let's unpack that more, Cynthia. So, the longevity researchers that you mentioned, um, some of them are even plant based, right? But they they are against excess protein or just having adequate protein because of mTOR. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned it. it's growth, it's anabolic, the opposite of autophagy. And we both know that mTOR in spurts is very healing and repairing and essential. You just broke down why autophagy too in spurts. You don't want too much mTOR. You don't want too much autophagy. There's a beautiful balance there. But they look at mTOR as growth, meaning cancer grows. Bad things grow in the body. So why has there been so much confusion around mTOR specifically with, in regards to this, this cancer situation? I think it's context. Mm. I think it's you know, a lot of these researchers, and I'm not specifically poking a finger, I think most of your listeners are probably aware of who these individuals are. You know, they're, they're funded by a great deal of industry money. They are, um, they are bringing up some points that I think are important to consider. I would argue that it is not this overactivation of mTOR that is fueling the cancer crisis that we're dealing with. It is, again, going back to this metabolic health crisis. It's understanding that it is not so simplistic to, if you eat too much protein, if you eat too often, it's going to, it's going to be too much uh, growth phase in this mTOR activation. It is really so much more than that. It is poor metabolic health. It is insulin resistance. It is obesity. It is um, the, the lack of sunlight. It is the poor emphasis on stress management. It is the poor quality sleep. It is people who um, eat hyper palatable, highly, highly processed foods. You know, average person right now is 60 to, 60 to 70 percent of Americans, the bulk of their diet is hyper-processed foods. So I don't think it's just one thing. And, it, and if we try to create a very reductionistic model, it's this one thing that's driving mm -hmm. cancer growth. That, it, it, it's far more than that. And if you are really looking at the cancer research and you're really speaking to people that that are they're you know actively in the research, and and certainly both of us have such amazing opportunities to connect with these individuals, it's not just one thing. It's so many things that are contributing. It's the exposure to endocrine mimicking chemicals. It mm. is the exposure to dirty 
air. It's the exposure to toxins throughout our lifestyle. It's many things that fuel that. So I think that we really, when, when we get fixated on the one thing, like, oh, too much protein, too much mTOR, too much cell growth, therefore it's bad. I think that reductionistic thinking is missing the big picture. It is our toxic lifestyles that are fueling our susceptibility to poor metabolic health, that are fueling our likelihood and propensity of developing a lot of these lifestyle-related cancers. It is totally criminal that we aren't having these conversations, that we aren't demanding better as consumers, as clinicians, yeah. as you know, we, we get to a point where we have these echo chambers. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that you and I are both growth minded and we pivot. And certainly there are things I'm sure we'll talk about today that I'll say, I've changed my thinking about X. I've evolved my thinking about Y. And then there are people who don't do that. You know, they put their blinders on and they have one message and they're going to, they're going to, that one message is just the, the one sole focus that they will, they will, you know, source their energy on against everything else. And I, and I just think we are designed to evolve, shift, and change as we grow as individuals. And I don't practice medicine the way I did in the 1990s. And I certainly don't think the way I did five years ago. And so we're constantly challenged to you know, get out of our own way. It's very easy to sit in an echo chamber. It's much very, harder yeah. to say, hey, you know what? No better, do better. Yeah. Uh, it remind, uh, well said. And it reminds me of a quote from Alvin Toffler. He said, the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And you're right as well with, um, you know, we've, we were blessed. You know, Cynthia has an amazing podcast called Everyday Wellness. So she's also a podcast host too. And we get to interview these amazing cancer researchers, oncologists, et cetera. And they all say the same thing. The ones that are forward thinking, it's multifactorial. Mm -hmm. it, it is not one thing. I mean, and there's so many things you listed there. On top of that, it's the trapped emotions, the mental health issues that lead to cancer as well. And that might be at the top too. Uh, when I interviewed Aaron, uh, Lee, Aaron, Dr. Keneally, excuse me, I said, I know cancer is uh, multifactorial, but if you have to choose one of the most common reasons why, she said trapped emotions. Yeah. So to your point, it's so many things. But on the topic of protein, so 30 grams per meal, you said, is the bare minimum. What if somebody's doing one meal a day? Is that problematic to only yes. get 30 grams? Okay, why is it problematic and what, what should they do? I am not a fan of OMAD. I don't like OMAD. OMAD is guaranteed to put you in a state of metabolic distress. And by that, I mean, you're not eating enough food. I don't know anyone that in one meal, maybe Ben, <laughs> I've eaten with Ben before. <laughs> ben can eat multiple meals at once. Yes. But the average person is not getting 100 grams of protein in a meal. And the bare minimum in my world is 100 grams of protein a day. And if you listen to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, one gram per pound of ideal body weight is what you're aiming for. Mm -hmm. So most, if not all of us, are not eating enough. And OMAD is fine. You go on vacation. You had a party the night before. You didn't. You overate. You're, you're too full. You're not even hungry. That is different as a reset. The OMAD, the chronic habitual OMAD, is going to put you in a state of deprivation. You're not going to be able to maintain muscle. And again, if you're north of 40, you are really going to put yourself in a dangerous, precarious position for metabolic health. And so when I think about OMAD, it is strategic. It is not something that is habitual. Mm -hmm. And there are far too many people. There are clinicians. There are health, there, there are health influencers out there that are omatting their, them themselves their way to you know developing metabolic disease and to having significant sarcopenia and it's not just you can be sarcopenic and thin you can also have sarcopenic obesity mm. that is something new yeah. which means you are under muscled and you are too much adipose tissue mm -hmm. and so when i think about omad i think about it as something that puts you at risk for developing the sequelae of sarcopenia which is going to impact metabolic health. It's going to contribute to insulin resistance. It is going to increase the likelihood that you are under eating chronically. And that is the greatest concern I have right now is that there is a whole slew of individuals out there that are chronically under eating. Yeah. Like it's just as bad as overeating. Yeah. Like people who get themselves to a point where they've whittled their metabolism down to I'm not hungry. Well, if you're only eating one meal a day, guess what? Your body thinks you're starving. It's going to hang on to every ounce of, of weight 
that's there. Cause there are a lot of these women, they end up in my DMS, they end up in my programs. They're yeah. wondering what's wrong. And I'm like, I don't like to use the word broken metabolism, but mm, like same. for that, yeah. for that, that vernacular, I say challenged, <laughs> challenged. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, it, it's one of those things like helping people understand, like you've gotten to a point where your body is so starved for nutrients that it is going to hang on to everything. And what I oftentimes find is it's, we have such a disordered relationship with food as a, as a culture Yeah. that we have a disordered relationship with our bodies. We have a disordered relationship with our health. We have a disordered relationship with the scale. And that is fueled by this narcissistic, troubling fixation on weight. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, weight is one part of the picture. It's a very small part too. And the scale, I would say, is a liar. A damn liar. Yeah. And it's like the sooner that I start helping people understand that we need to shift our perspectives. It's like, first of all, we need to nourish our bodies. Like, when did we get to a point as a culture that we have started restricting so much? It's almost like we're mentally constipated and that we we literally have gotten to the point where we just restrict, restrict, restrict. We over-restrict our food. We fast too much. We over-exercise. It's like self-flagellation. Mm. It's like, when did we stop being kind to our bodies? When do we stop being kind? So I, I think it is driven. I mean, obviously this is a bigger conversation than just what we're having now, but it's driven by so many things, but it troubles me enormously that OMAD has become a, such a big thing that people who are doing it, they get angry when I suggest they should perhaps switch things up, eat more than one meal a day, understand that you need that hundred grams of protein. If you're not working towards that, that's concerning for me because metabolic health is where it's at. Mm -hmm. And I think for so many people, they get widgeted down, like they start fasting more and more and more and they're eating less and less food. And before they know it, they're like eating like a, a lean cuisine. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's not nourishment. Like you're barely giving your body the fuel it needs to function. And they wonder why their hair is falling out and right. they're weight loss resistant. And they're, they're really like, they have you know, you mentioned that the toxic emotions, you know, these repressed emotions, a lot of people are experiencing. And I think that that toxic diet culture has fueled this. I think it is, it is, um, perhaps magnified by what we see in Hollywood. It's not yeah. helped by print ads. It's not helped by filters. And I'm not just talking about the, Oh, I'm not wearing makeup filter. I'm talking about the amount of filtering that people do and, and, you know, making their bodies not look, they make their bodies look smaller. Their waist looks smaller. Their butt looks small. I mean, all these things that have now are demonstrating for younger generations, even my generation, heck, that what they're seeing is not even real. Right. And so it's like, we're not living in reality. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's gonna cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60 minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, 
head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code bond charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your bond charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. It's wild, isn't it? Yes. So you, to, to clarify, you're not against OMAD. You're against chronic OMAD where Correct. it's not strategic. Correct. Like H Chronic habitual OMAD. I'm with you 100%. Problem. Like personally, I'll do uh, a 24-hour fast accidentally. Like yesterday, um, I had a really busy day and <laughs> I just ended up you know, having one meal. But that one meal was at a steakhouse <laughs> and I feasted, right? So I accidentally do it. But sometimes when I'm traveling, I'll do it. But yeah, chronically not good. And you're right. I get the DMs too. And I say, we need to mix things up. Or somebody who's been doing carnivore for four years, we got to mix things up. And they don't really like to hear that no. because they... It worked for them in the beginning. They got results. So it's hard to kind of break from that because the thing that helped you is now the thing that might be hurting you. Yeah. It's a hard thing to face. On the protein topic, so you mentioned, and I agree with that, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons recommendation. That's what I teach too. One gram of protein per pound of your ideal body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, but your goal weight is 130 pounds, then you want to consume 130 grams of protein per day. Then the next question is, okay, there's different types of protein. Uh, ben, I'm having legumes and chickpeas. I'm having my plant-based protein. Is that the same if I get 130 grams of plant-based protein versus 130 grams of animal-based protein? What's the difference there? Yeah, it's a great question, Ben, and one I get asked often. So I feel comfortable and confident in saying that the amino acid composition of animal-based protein is superior to plant-based protein. I respect and I, I admire those that choose not to eat animal-based protein my concern is always this. If you are not eating animal-based protein and you're trying to make up for 30 grams of plant-based protein, you are going to end up overeating carbohydrates. And I asked Dr. Lyons when she was on the podcast recently, like, you know, you are a metabolic health expert. Like, what is your threshold for carbohydrates? And she said, no more than 30 grams in the context of someone not being mentally, mentally metabolically healthy someone who's insulin resistant, diabetic, no more than 30 grams in a meal. So if you're plant-based and you're trying to figure that widget out, it's going to be very challenging. So Wait, so you're saying if you're metabolically challenged, so insulin resistant type 2 diabetic, no more than 30 grams of protein per meal if it's plant-based? Is... So no more than 30 grams of carbohydrate. Oh, carbs. So, sorry. So the, sorry, Got it. sorry. Sorry for the clarification. Yeah. So I think that's where the challenge becomes of, yes, you're, you're aiming for that 30 grams of protein. Got it. But if you're plant-based, you're consuming a lot more carbohydrate, and that's where it becomes challenging. Yeah. I oftentimes will encourage the vegetarians who are open to eating eggs, or if they eat some dairy, it's like, okay, let's try to buffer mm -hmm. so we can find a happy medium. I think it becomes very challenging if you're vegan, though, to get enough plant-based protein. And and the thing that's, that's interesting is um, I, I don't think we know enough about a lot of these pea-based proteins, I, I just don't think we know enough. There's not enough research to show like what's the long-term impact on muscle protein synthesis. What's the long-term impact on leucine thresholds? So it gets challenging. It gets very challenging because I, I acknowledge and I respect people's decisions if they're yeah. choosing not to eat animal-based protein. But the, the workaround is, are you insulin sensitive? Are you metabolically healthy? Then you can probably get away with a little bit more plant-based protein at the expense of some carbohydrates. However, if you're perimenopausal, you're menopausal, mm. um, that is going to be challenging because that is a time when women are going to have to change their relationship with carbohydrates. Yeah, It's it's just a, a fact that we become less insulin sensitive. And if you're combining that with not being metabolically healthy, then you really have to be diligent. And it could be that, you know, maybe you track macros for a period of time just to get a sense for like, where am I? Yeah. And I usually say, listen, you know, we're all on a continuum. It's figuring out like, you're fine tuning things as you go. Like, what would you start with? I would start with trying to get more protein in so you're more satiated because there's something called the protein leverage hypothesis. Yeah, talk about that. And so when we talk about the protein leverage hypothesis in the context of middle-aged women in particular, because this is where the I know the research better, it's understanding that if you don't get enough protein into your diet, your body is going to work diligently to getting in the calories and it's not going to be in the types of calories you want. It's gonna be carbs yeah. and fat. So women will say to me, they're menopausal, late perimenopause, I ate, but I still feel like eating. And that low estrogen state with high FSH, as I was talking about, 
it will kind of stimulate this protein. Your, your body's looking for that caloric intake to be met and it's going to keep you not satiated and you're going to keep looking for that food. And, and this is where people get into trouble post meal. It's after dinner. That's when the chips come out, the ice cream comes out, the cookies come out because it's going to be like, what's a quick source of food. And I oftentimes will say to these women, if you're really hungry, have a piece of chicken. If you're really hungry, have some shrimp. If you're really hungry, have some rolled up deli meat. If you're mm-hmm. really hungry, have a piece of beef jerky. They're like, that's never what I want. <laughs> right, exactly. And so understanding that your body is very intelligent and it's looking for a way to make up for that lack of caloric intake. So I, I think it always goes back to if you're hitting your protein macros, things will fall into place. And and I think this is important for everyone. This happens for men too. I had my husband track his macros for two weeks. What did we see? surprisingly he was nearly where he needed to be with the protein yes nice but i said you need more protein at lunchtime Mm. like that was where i was noticing breaking his fast he would sit down and i was like you know you're you're my husband's wonderful but you know he's 54 now and he he can't eat the way he did 30 years ago Mm -hmm. and so helping him understand like maybe this is when you have the leftovers for lunch Mm -hmm. instead of that sandwich (laughs) you've been eating for 20 years Mm -hmm. maybe the thing to do is to introduce like leftovers from the night before like don't make it complicated i know you're working during the day and so he's actually found that the more he's leaned into protein for especially when breaking is fast the better he feels he doesn't get an afternoon slump he's not looking for junk in the afternoon and I think that has a, a, a huge net impact on, you know, just the way that you're viewing your world. And we know what we choose to break our fast with in particular sets our blood sugar regulation mm-hmm. up for the rest of the day. So, you know, we always say like more carbohydrates in that first meal, you're going to be more hyperphagic. You're going to be looking for more food. The research certainly suggests higher protein, more satiety, less likely to continue eating. You know, you're not going to be foraging for food. You know, you're not going to be in your pantry all afternoon long. Yeah. And you talk about that uh, in your book, The Fasting Transformation. So I'm holding it up here on YouTube. If you haven't gotten it, go get it. Uh, do you want them to go to Amazon to get it or should they go somewhere else? Yep. Amazon works, Barnes and Noble. Bookstores. Fasting, Intermittent Fasting Transformation is the name of the book. So I want to stay on this topic of protein because I'm, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about those who are listening and watching and some of the thoughts or questions that might pop up for them that I want to Make sure we nail it all. With the protein, I mean, you mentioned that it's satiating. We know it activates cholecystokinin, leptin, peptide, YY. These are chemicals and hormones that tell the brain and the stomach, you know, you're full, put down the fork. These are good things. And when you don't get enough of it, the protein hypothesis, the hi- protein hypothesis leverage uh, seeks that in order to fulfill that desire of those amino acids. And I don't totally buy that hypothesis for the general community, mm-hmm. but it makes sense in the context of yes. postmenopausal women. Yes, so particular. I buy that for sure. Yeah. Um, but with the protein thing, we have individuals who are practicing intermittent fasting. They learn from you, Cynthia. They learn from me. They're doing their 18-6 or their 16-8. You're a big fan of that. Uh, the question I get, Ben, how do I get that 130 grams of protein in my two meals? Um, uh, it's hard to o- eat that much protein. Can I throw in um, some amino acids? Can I throw in a protein shake? What are some things I can do to hit it in my eating window? It's a fantastic question. It's an important one. And the first thing I always say now is if you can't get your protein into your window, you may need to adjust your window. Mm. That's number one. And I'll explain why in a second. Number two, I think that you're slowly working your way up to that one gram per pound of ideal body weight. I sometimes will say for women, 100 grams, just to give them something to focus on because 150 175, it just seems daunting, yeah. like really challenging. So we'll work on like, let's reframe and we'll focus on 100 as a starting point. So it's slowly increasing. Maybe you're going from 30 to 40. Now, this again is in the context of individuals that are metabolically healthy. If you're not metabolically healthy, or you know you're insulin resistant, it may take a longer bit of time to work your way up because your body's, you know, you're, you're insulin resistant. Those cells are less sensitive to the you know stimulation and, and the hormonal regulation of insulin. So sometimes you have to do that more slowly, but slowly working your way up. I always say, you know, track with chronometer. I mean, I have no affiliation them. with them. It's yeah. free. Um, that's a great app to kind of get a real like hard sense of where you are. So it's slowly working your way up. I'm not expecting people to go from eating 50 grams of protein a day to hundred. That's not realistic. It may take a couple of weeks. I encourage people to wait, like not perpetually, but like weigh your food, track with chronometer, get a sense of where things are, adjust your fasting and feeding windows if you need to. I actually have been experimenting with wider feeding windows for myself because I sometimes even struggle to get 
that much protein in, depending on what my day is like, depending what responsibilities I have during the day. Now, I do think that there it's completely acceptable to use a high quality protein shake if you're struggling to get those macros done um, and and ingested. Now, if you tolerate whey, I mean, whey is fantastic, and we know that's far superior to most other options. Not everyone's dairy tolerant, and mm-hmm. so that we have to think about that. But if you're going to do a protein shake, do a protein shake that's high quality. Do one that doesn't have a long list of ingredients. Make sure it doesn't have any junky seed oils or um, artificial sugars. Like yeah. I'm not a fan of aspartame or sucralose. They're crap and garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, I think stevia or monk fruit is fine, depending on how you react to that. Xylitol and Swerve and uh, Erythritol? I think those are fine provided they... So I think this is very bio-individual because I find that um, a lot of those sugar alcohols can be bloating. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially if you have SIBO. Yes. Our friend Vinny Tortorich talks Mm. about what happens at keto events. (laughs) At the bathroom? In the bathroom. (laughs) He's like, it's a Jackson Pollock painting. (laughs) Um, And so just understand like some people, those things are really tough on the digestive system. So for me, I do fine with stevia. And so I, I don't have any problems with that. But some of the other ones can be a little gas bloating and that's something I try to avoid as a woman. So I think that those are fine. I think amino acids can be fine. In fact, I've started incorporating more amino acids kind of into my lifestyle given how active things are. Um, you know, when you're looking at other types of protein powders, cause inevitably this will come up bone broth protein is fine, but it's not a complete protein. So you have to remember that just like collagen peptides are not a complete protein. Correct. Um, if you're looking at like vegetarian options, they tend to be gritty. This has been my personal experience. I probably have tried everything. I always say like, I give it a good college try. (laughs) Um, but sometimes I just don't like the grit, Mm -hmm. whether it's rice, you know, rice flour, rice based or pea protein. Um, sometimes they can be clumpy. I've had people suggest Trevani. Um, and certainly that's just, I don't have that in my house, but that could certainly be a, that's, Food Babes product again. I haven't tried it. Yeah, um, yeah. that's I, I haven't I don't have it in my house, but uh, I, apparently that's a fairly mm-hmm. clean option that's available. So I, I think for a variety of individuals, it's it's figuring out like what helps you maintain your sanity, because I think sometimes people overthink it, get stressed, and the stress causes more stress, and then it just becomes something that's overwhelming. Yeah. And like the last thing we want to do is to be creating a situation that people feel is not sustainable and is super stressful. So I think for those reasons, I think that's typically like adjust your fasting and feeding window. Yeah. Like you, I, I couldn't do a four hour feeding window. I would never be able to get enough food in. I would not, I would not be hungry mm. for my next meal before four hours. Yeah. And so we all know about the migrating motor complex and how important it is to give our bodies, you know, four to five hours of rest in between meals. So I think for that reason, you know, for a lot of individuals, they have to do a degree of experimentation. And for everyone listening, it might look a little bit different. You know, maybe that, you know, there's a man out there who does better having like a nine hour feeding window. And that's, you know, he, that's how he's able to get in his meals and someone else might be able to do it in six, maybe because they're a little bit younger and they've got a little bit more vibrant, uh, digestive fire than some of the rest of us. Um, I know that I've been experimenting with wider feeding windows because I've been able to get all of my protein in and being able to sometimes do it three times, three meals, you know, two smaller, one bigger. Um, I, that's what I've been experimenting with, um, over the past couple of months. And that's been interesting to see along with, you know, actively working on building muscle. Uh, perfect aminos has a good plant-based protein. It's clean. Uh, I don't, again, the taste is not the best. I'd rather go personally. I do uh, a different uh, collagen protein powder that has different strains of collagen that makes it complete there's some out there that do that and i also like dr bickman's health code shakes mm-hmm. as well uh, but it does have whey and dairy so you got to be cognate uh, aware of that but um what are your thoughts on because that's to supplement actually eating the actual food as yep. you said it's not to replace it it's yep. a supplement to help you get there you mentioned you're taking amino acids um is it perfect aminos is and and how are you doing it personally I've been using Keon's product, yeah. so it's essential aminos. And, and I, I that, think it's the same, actually. I yeah. think uh, they oh, use same. the same source. Oh, I'm pretty sure, but you know, don't fact. You <laughs> can fact check me, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing that because I, I've been ex- I've been doing a the degree of n of one experimentation to kind of see like where's the happy point of, you know, how much protein can I get in and how much working out can I do? And so mm-hmm. right now I'm I'm we're tweaking my testosterone, and so. It's been interesting to kind of see, you know, what do I need more of? And so I I feel, excuse me, I actually feel better taking the the essential aminos for me personally. Um, Sometimes I use the powder. Sometimes I use the capsules. It just depends on 
you know, what my day is like and how I'm trying to, you know, be conscientious about supplementation. But how do you I, do the capsules? Do you swallow them because they're pretty big or do you chew them and swallow them? I swallow them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're, it's like nine. At a, I mean, it's, it's yeah, some obscene I, I take dose. Yeah. yeah. It's like some obscene, you know, they're, amount. I'm good at swallowing capsules, but for some reason, those they're very big. They're really big. So I chew them, but they don't taste that great. Yeah. So I chase it down with like electrolytes or something with like lemon lime. Like like, it's like a shooter. Let me it is. Take it down. Yeah. But I also feel good with the uh, amino yeah. acids. Continue. Yeah. No, no. So I, I think it, it's just the beauty of saying, you know, I'm always open to trying new things. And I was pleasantly surprised that when I was taking the amino acids, I actually felt better. And four years ago when I was hospitalized, um, perfect aminos were what I took, uh, because I, I literally, my digestion was such a disaster yeah. that that was one of the things that I took. And I agree. The pills are enormous they and are. hard to swallow. I remember it was like, I had to like gear myself up. I'm like, I'm not normally someone who struggles with swallowing pills, but these are enormous. <laughs> Last question on protein. And we have other topics to cover. Um, what about the person who says I'm trying to eat more protein, but I have a hard time breaking it down and kind of just sits in my gut. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for that person? Well, my, my clinician brain always thinks, you know, just, we know that we make less hydrochloric acid with age, like after, like most things, it's like, you know, it's like a, a car that's got, it needs to have its tires replaced. Right. We just need got the miles on maintenance, it. right? Exactly. Yeah. So after 40, we're making less hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is one of these things that helps break down uh, proteins into amino acids. So I think about that first, like, are they making enough hydrochloric acid? But then I also think about the fact that, you know, do they have a latent infection? Do they have H. pylori? If they have H. pylori, I don't mm. want to give them hydrochloric acid. So sometimes there's, I, I like to look at gut health testing. Um, but sometimes I, I, I think for a lot of people, they just have not been eating much protein for so long. It can be very situational. I find that beef in particular, for some people, they'll say, I can, do, I do fine with chicken or fish. It's when I eat a large bolus yeah, of beef. I've seen that too. That I suddenly am like, time out. This isn't, I just feel bloated. I feel this, I feel that. And I'm like, okay, maybe it's portion dependent. So maybe instead of the 10 ounce ribeye, you need the four ounce filet. Like, mm -hmm. it, like maybe it really is. You need to make it easier for your body, smaller portion, less fatty meat. Let's see how you do with that. Because I do find for a lot of individuals, it can sometimes be the fatty meat, fish, poultry. Like if you're doing duck, if you're doing a chicken thigh, if you're doing um, you know, a ribeye, if you're doing a piece of salmon, it's the fat combined with the protein that sometimes can be problematic. And there is SNPs, there are genetic SNPs that I happen to have one of these. Um, I don't do well with a lot of animal-based fat. So That's right. for some of these people, it can be augmenting the portions of the meat and maybe they need some hydrochloric acid or some gut testing, but also considering you may genetically be predisposed to not tolerating animal-based fat all that well. And mm -hmm. you may just need leaner pieces of meat, fish, and poultry to be able to, you know, not feel like you've got a lead brick in your stomach. Yeah. Okay. I think we covered pretty much <laughs> everything everybody wants to know about protein on yes. any diet, but especially keto. <clears throat> Let's transition to fasting for a little bit as it pertains to postmenopausal women and some considerations for them and why, you know, uh, maybe a game plan for postmenopausal women to practice fasting and what exactly is happening with their stress hormones, the adrenal glands, why it's picking up the slack at that time. And how do they know if they're finding the right fasting schedule or not? Yeah. I, I jokingly say, um, for, especially for the menopausal women who will say I, the, the scale is stuck. I plateaued. I can't lose weight. I'm like, well, first of all, how is your sleep? Mm. Because the real issue is if I can't get you to sleep through the night, I can't get you to lose yeah. weight. That's been a message you've been delivering for yes. years. And I, I believe this. Yeah. It's something I talk about all the time. It's so important. I'm like, focus on the sleep first. Like, you know, it's like namaste. Like, let's do that first. <laughs> it's foundational. So, I agree. Exactly. And I'm like, I can get you to sleep. It's going to, your blood sugar is going to be better balanced. Your yeah. insulin levels will be better. Your cortisol will be down. Digestion. So, everything's right. Better. Everything. And so, so that's number one. Um, I, I want them to manage their stress before they start adding more hormetic stress. Mm -hmm. So if you are not getting enough sleep and you hate your job and you don't like your husband and you don't like where you live and you don't have good relationships with your loved ones um, and you're over exercising or not exercising and you eat a hyper processed, hyper palatable diet, don't, don't start with fasting. Mm -hmm. Like really, I want you to start with try to do one thing for yourself every day. I don't care if you walk for 10 minutes after a meal or maybe you... Um, create a, a bedtime ritual that's going to manage your stress, but also allow you to sleep better. 
I, I think the other thing is when we talk about women in menopause, which we know that this is already a vulnerable population, we know that the average woman is going to go into menopause at the age of 51 here in the United States. That applies to most westernized countries as well. Uh, and we know that the medical system really is uh, poorly prepared for how to support women at this stage of life. So they get a lot of misinformation. You know, it's normal. Weight gain is a normal function of aging. Yeah, all your symptoms are common. Yeah, exactly. It's just part it's of it. It's all in your head. Yeah. You're meant to be tired and obese. This is supposed to be normal. I like the way that uh, Anna Quebec, our friend Anna Quebec says uh, that menopause is mandatory, but suffering is optional. Correct. And I mean, that's that I couldn't say it better myself. Um, and so when I think about fasting for menopausal women... It's really be kind to yourself first before you even think about adding fasting. Mm. So hormesis is a beneficial stress in the right amount at the right time. And I think for a lot of individuals, they add gasoline mm. and they just light the match. And so fasting is designed to support our bodies. It's not meant to be added stressors to the body in a non-beneficial way. So for a lot of people, it might just be 12 hours of digestive rest. And there's no shame in that. No. You know, maybe that's what you start with. And I actually would argue that every person listening irrespective of where they are in life should not eat for 12 hours a day. Mm. Like really it, it, that should be the gold standard. My teenagers unbelievably can go 12 hours of that eating. And it's not because they're fasting. It's because after dinner until they wake up in the morning, they're not eating. And that's except for ice cream sometimes on Friday or Saturday. And that's a whole separate <laughs> conversation. But when we're, when we're talking to women about fasting at that stage of life, it's helping them understand that more fasting is not necessarily efficacious in every instance. Do I think that there's great assistance with utilizing some varied schedules strategically? Absolutely. Yeah. I think longer bouts of fasting for some people may be helpful to get them started. I always worry about long fast and loss of muscle mass mm -hmm. in individuals who are already at risk for loss of more muscle mass anyway. And so I think that's where that therapeutic stroke that therapeutic edge that communication and working with people that know what they're doing you know working you know with your team working with my team working with individuals who know how to coach women through this process i think is very important knowing how to fuel your body because again remember i mentioned that toxic diet culture about yeah. um so many women are just beating themselves up i mean i listened i mean they say it out loud so imagine what they're saying to themselves mm. internally they're beating themselves up because the scale is stuck and you know their their healthcare provider hasn't really provided much guidance, and um, and I say this because I probably contributed to some distress the women experienced because I didn't know better, but I always say know better, do better. Now yeah. I know better, but helping women understand what's changing in their body, what needs to be done, the considerations, the things that can support your body at this time, helping people understand that fasting is just one strategy of many, and. If you're using it selectively and properly, it can be very helpful for a lot of people. They just don't realize they're mindlessly eating all day long, mm. that they eat from the moment they get up to the moment they go to bed. And when they stop, when they, when they start being more aware and cognizant of when they're eating, what they're eating, how frequently they're eating, they can then start making strides towards, you know, getting into a system where maybe they're having three meals a day and not snacking in between and not snacking at nighttime and maybe they're cognizant of the influence of things like alcohol. Mm. You know, maybe when they drink alcohol, they don't make good choices about what they're eating and how much they're eating. And so I think that there's many, many things that play a role. We know that women, because of changes in progesterone, are going to struggle with sleep. They have more anxiety and depression at this stage in their lives. Um, you know, the, the loss of estrogen, depending on the individual and, and when they have this precipitous drop off, it usually is towards the tail end of perimenopause into menopause, can influence their eating patterns, can influence their sleep quality. Testosterone is not just about libido. Testosterone is your motivating hormone. It's the get off the couch and go to the gym hormone. It's the body composition hormone and helping women understand that there is no shame in talking to your healthcare provider about hormone replacement therapy whether you're appropriate for it, and can they help you make decisions? Because I always say that it's the icing on the cake. It's after everything else is tailored and dialed in, the sleep, the stress, the nutrition, the fasting, the strength training, the um, you know emotional support if you need that. Because you know without talking about our feelings, they're gonna manifest in other ways. And we know high ACE scores, so adverse childhood events, influence weight loss resistance as well. Yeah. And so, as well as autoimmune conditions. So if you got one, you're more prone to others. 
but helping women understand that whether you choose to do HRT or not, you need to make an educated decision. Mm -hmm. You need to work with someone that is going to be able to counsel you on the pros and the cons and your own risk factors because, um, and I was sharing this with you before we started recording, if you saw me, I'm a super healthy weight. I sleep well. I have a very happy life. I was off HRT for six months. And if you looked at my inflammatory markers and my lipids and everything else, my doctor said, I wouldn't know this is the same person. Wow. So for me, I take HRT because I want to protect my bones, my brain, and my heart. And that's very important to me. And I was mentioning to you that like I've had this golden workup, but I would be remiss if I didn't share that on the outside, I look totally healthy. No mm -hmm. one would ever know. So make sure, it, you know, that last piece of like that menopausal aspect of, of what we're talking about, I think just think it's important whether you choose to do HRT or not, that's your choice. Get informed so that you can make the best choice for yourself because my mother's generation, they're all in their 70s. And, you know, after the Women's Health Initiative came out in 2002, they were all taken off their HRT. Mm. And I'm watching the sequelae of what's happening to them. And it's and they have given me permission to talk about it. Um, they're like, I want your generation to make sure that people understand they have options. And the options could be choosing not to do anything. Right. But to you know have that you options. have options. Yeah. I think that that's a really important message for women. So you're telling me, Cynthia, that there's all these factors that influence weight gain and weight loss. I thought it was as easy as just eating less and moving more. I know. <laughs> no? It's no. not that easy? No. No. And in fact, it's so funny that I, I, I probably uttered that never that disrespectfully to a patient. I would just say, I think we just need to move more uh -huh. and eat less food. I've done it too. You know, but understanding that there's so much at play and as simple as understanding what estrogen does in our bodies as a woman, estradiol, this predominant form of estrogen until we go into menopause is an insulin sensitizing hormone. That's why in the beginning of your cycle, you can push your workouts, you can push your fasting schedule, you can, you can, if you're much more insulin sensitive, you can get away with a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Things change when progesterone predominates into the luteal phase. And I, I know we're talking about menopausal women, but helping people understand what progesterone does. Progesterone helps with hair. Progesterone helps with sleep. It helps with reducing anxiety and depression. And, you know, I can tell, like, as an example, like testosterone helps with lean muscle mass. I know we haven't perfected where mine is because I'm still having trouble, like, building muscle. And so it's interesting that we don't talk about these things. Like we just assume women get pushed off a cliff and we're like, sorry, mm -hmm. you know, just go live your life and try to figure this all out. And it's okay. Like some people, you know, like 25% of women still make enough testosterone in menopause that they wouldn't need replacement, but the rest of us probably benefit from it. I definitely feel like my brain just kind of clicks on when I've got testosterone on board. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So it's, it's very important topic to, to cover because I mean, some, for some people it could be taboo to talk about HRT or they've completely dismissed it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's a time and place for it, but just to know that it is an option and it might be a really viable option for you that could actually help the way you feel and look. I like that you mentioned hormesis, uh, mm -hmm. something that I, I just love the principle of hormesis, right? What well, doesn't kill you makes you stronger, meaning the right amount of stress, you adapt to it, you get stronger. So for example, fasting is a hormetic stress exercise. You have a red light panel behind you. That's a hormetic stress. Heck, just going outside and getting sunshine. These are all cold plunging, but there's a nice balance. Mm -hmm. And you know, like with the cold plunging world, I, th I think in general, cold plunging is way overrated and overhyped. And there's a valuable tool to be used with cold plunging. Like so many people first do it and they do too much. You violated hormesis. So you do it too cold. You Same thing with fasting. You learn about it. You do too much. You violate hormesis. So I want to get your thoughts on this. I like to use uh, heart rate variability as a good gauge to see if you're in that hormetic zone. And if I see somebody who has uh, their HRV is trending down, their heart rate ability is trending down, that's a time to pull back the stressors. Yeah. And then when I see it trending up, okay, let's add some more in. What are your thoughts on that? I love that you're so strategic about your recommendations. I 100% agree. And I would add that HRV is a great uh, tool for that. But it's also understanding like there's so much genetic susceptibility to this. Like I had a conversation with Dr. Sarah Gottfried and she was saying that there's genetic SNPs specific to cold exposure. Like she was saying like, I don't need to do a cold plunge. Like I hate the cold loathe the cold. So for me, cryotherapy is 
Like that, re- I get a lot out you of or, that. You or Sarah? Or I, you're I, saying this, okay. No, no, but she had said that she herself. Got it, but you hate the cold is what you're saying. Hate the cold, okay. Hate the cold. But it just tells me I need to do that because that's that little bit of stress that is going to make me stronger and more resilient, right? Same. So yeah, exactly. So that's why you live in Miami. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's also like helping people understand that uh, a little bit, a little bit of one thing, and it could be a little bit more. Like I tolerate the, I tolerate heat a whole lot. Like Same. I can sit in the infrared sauna and I'm happy as a clam. And like I actually sleep better on the days I do mm-hmm. infrared sauna. I sleep better on the days I do cryotherapy. So very clearly for me, um, there's benefits. But if I'm starting to feel like I'm getting sick, which thankfully doesn't happen often, if I'm doing a lot of business travel. If I'm up late and I'm not getting enough sleep, those are not the days that I add gasoline to that fire. It's really strategic. And actually, the interesting thing is um, I stopped doing long fasts. What do you would categorize long fast? How, I how do long? nothing more than 24 hours. Okay, so you would categorize anything over 24 hours as long fast and you've capped it at that? How, and how? why did you cap that? And then how often are you doing 24 hours? Very rarely. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. I think, well, I know... In 2019, when I had a long hospitalization, I was like, okay, check in with myself. I will never not eat for that long a period of time again. (laughs) But I do think that I'm so conscientious about maintaining muscle that I'm not willing, as a lean person, I'm not willing to lose muscle to do a long fast. So that's where that decision was made. That what, what, what about, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, um, no. what, what about, because there's, there's an argument to that. What about the argument that, like, for example, when they looked at what fasting did for the immune system, it weakens your immune system because your white blood cells drop. And then Dr. Walter Longo proves that that's the autophagy. It actually builds up stronger. What about the same case with your uh, muscle mass and the protein that you lose during a long fast, but then when you refeed properly, it builds back even healthier and stronger. Even Dr. Fung has spoken about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like as a woman, like I, there may be some gender differences. So I, I will, I respectfully, uh, you know, I, 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 Dr. Longo and Dr. Fung, you know, we, we both admire and, and put up on, For sure. you know, these, these fasting pedestals. But I think when we're talking about women in the context of women, got it. In a perimenopausal or menopausal space, I think we have to be very cautious about losing lean muscle mass. And I think for me personally, and I'm speaking from a personal perspective, and then I can speak to it as a generalization, I'm not willing to lose muscle mass to fast longer. Mm-hmm. Like that is that has become something that I've worked so hard to build back up what I lost four years ago that I'm not willing to lose it. And how are you tracking your muscle mass to know? Well, it's interesting. I just asked Dr. Lyon, you know, what's the best way to track? And she was indicating that there is some new technology coming out that's not out yet. Um, You know, I like to try a bod pod. I mean, you could certainly, you know, do these um, bioimpedance scales. That's what I have here. Yeah, Yeah, the bioimpedance scales. Although last time I stepped on a bioimpedance scale, I think at KetoCon, it told me it wanted me to gain 20 pounds of muscle. And I was like... (laughs) 20 pounds on me would be a lot. I'm like five foot three. It would be. Um, so I was like, I'm not sure that's actually accurate for me, but maybe it works for everybody else. But I, I think it's in the context of, um, you know, bioindividuality rules. Mm-hmm. I think there are certainly a lot of people who are not insulin sensitive, who are diabetic, who benefit from these longer fasts. Um, I, I think you have to work with individuals who know how to walk you through appropriate fasting regimens. But I'm talking about lean middle-aged people understood and like ted Naiman is now come out against this um in, in particular he's like as a lean person i think longer fasting is something i get concerned about and i haven't yet listened to his podcast with marty kendall which just came mm, out but it cool. was like on my mental radar i was like okay i gotta listen to that but i think that's where my concern comes from is, is purely from a loss of muscle mass because it is so much harder to build at this stage of life like if i were my kid's age or i were younger and I was still getting a period every month, it would be very different. But now I'm just at a stage where I'm not willing to lose what I have. I understand that. I, and and I think that a lot of the the majority of people who do those longer fasts are looking to get more autophagy. And yeah. I'd love if you could just break down. That's great. And there are other ways to achieve the autophagy yeah. versus a longer fast. So how can we get more autophagy without having to go along with our fast? Yeah. I mean, the thing that's interesting about autophagy is this, you know, waste and recycling process in the body. And I, I'm noticing just a interplay this with our conversation there are other people are starting to talk about this instead of doing a lot of fasting what i'm doing now in lieu of that is this and so we know certain types of exercise can induce autophagy certain types of compounds can induce autophagy Um, understanding that you know cold exposure heat exposure you know hormesis in general is going to can induce and can magnify some of these these principles so i think when people say 
Um, I don't, and there are people, you know, I know there are people out there. This is where bio individuality rules. They're like, I can do a 12 hour digestive rest, but I don't feel good mm-hmm. when I don't eat at least uh, three meals a day. And I'm like, okay, I can respect that. But I think it's helping people understand there's other ways to kind of get this benefit of hormetic stress and the, you know, upregulation and autophagy, whether it's with, you know, um, I just did a, a YouTube video about this, but I was talking about mushrooms and, you know, ginger and how some mm. of these, you know, plant-based synalytics. compounds, yep, synalytics can be helpful for that. Um, helping people understand that, you know, this, you know, cold therapies and, and warm therapies, understanding how they can, you know, upregulate these heat and cold shock proteins, which can be beneficial. So I, I think that there's many ways to do it, whether it's high intensity interval training, there's different ways to do it that don't necessarily involve just not eating. And, and I think that's an important distinction to make that, you know, it's, it's almost like a buffet. Like you can pick different things and find what works for you or try different things each week to find out what works for you. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, a rigid system. And, and I think for a lot of individuals, they, they want rigidity. Mm-hmm. And I sometimes have to remind them, I'm like, you know, what's important is to be flexible. That's right. Bio individual, bio individuality. So on that, t- I mean, you know, hypothetically, if somebody did a 18 hour water fast because mm-hmm. they're looking for autophagy mm-hmm. and they're thinking, okay, I want to actually get more autophagy. So maybe I should go 48 hours instead of 18 hours. But instead of doing that, they maybe add another hormetic stressor during that fast, like a workout or an ice plunge. They might be able to achieve what they wanted to get in 48 hours in that same window because they're applying these stressors if it's an appropriate day to do so. Would right. that be a fair hypothesis? I, th- I think that's reasonable. I mean, sometimes people will, and I'm sure they do this with you. It's like you get a message. Well, how many hours do I have to fast before I get before I hit autophagy? Oh, so popular that question. And so I always say, well, we can't measure it at home. Yeah. So you know, over 24 hours, you're gonna, you know, you if you're just solely fasting, you're gonna get more benefit from that. But helping people understand that. You know, I think sometimes the potentiation of benefits can be garnered by putting, you know, different components together, like you were mentioning. I think that can be hugely yeah. impactful. Yeah, uh, hormesis stacking, we'll yes, call it. Yes, I love but, stacking. Yeah, right. But you have to actually, like, that would be like a day where your HRV is increased. And the HRV thing is a perfect example of genetics and, and individuality, right? It's like you cannot compare... I cannot compare my HRV scores to Cynthia nope. and, and, and somebody else's. I mean, because there's genetics there. There's so many variables. But we find our own baseline and average after, let's say, 14 days of tracking it. This is your baseline. Let's say it's 37. Okay, now I'm just going to work on building it up. And on the days that it's actually higher than my baseline, good day for the hormetic stress. Maybe that's the day I do the cold plunge. But let's say it's lower than the average. Okay, let me dial back that fasting window. Let me do a little bit more feasting, more instead of doing my CrossFit work, workout, I do more like yoga or walking, right? It's super cool that we have this this gadget, the Aura Ring or whatever we do to track the HRV to kind of do this. Isn't it awesome? It is awesome. And I, and I have to admit, like I'm a gigantic data nerd. <laughs> yeah, I know you me. are. <laughs> I'm like, I just love to like get the validation. I'm like, oh, even though I'm in this Airbnb, I got two hours of like, Deep nice. sleep last night. I was like, that's great. And for a 52 year old, that's fantastic. That's awesome. You know, if my HRV is in the 50s, I'm happy. Now, I was laughing one day because Louisa Nicola, I think, uh, I don't know if you follow Louisa, she's got this neuro, mm. she's, she's like very neuro focused, but mm. she has a great podcast. And she was like, had her like HRV up. And I was like, oh my God, it's so much better. But I was like, I have to remember you're in your 30s. It's totally exactly. different. And so always context, like there are age related changes. And I think Peter Ratia even talks about this. Like, you know, you don't expect the HRV of a 50 year old to be what a 25 year old is. No. And so if you're trying to compare yourself to a 25 year old, you're never going to be, I, I'm not ever going to be 90 for an HRV. That would be, that would probably physiologically not be possible, <laughs> right. but I'm good. If I'm in the fifties, I'm good. I, if I'm in the twenties, I'm like, that's not the day to push right. things. Right. That's not the day I'm doing hit. That's not the day I'm going to try to do a personal breast in the gym. That's yeah. not the day that I'm going to try to skate by with like, you know, an OMAD. That is not the day to do that. Yeah, it's cool to have that as a gadget. You know, a perfect example, my fiance, you know, Natasha, my fiance, she's uh, 33, I believe, or 30, 33. Yeah, I'm 39. And my HRV average these days, 75 or so, which is terrific. Because when I first started tracking it uh, about four years ago, it was around 40-ish. Mm. So I've built, I've come, almost doubled That's it. Awesome. But her, her HRV average has always been over 150. Wow. hundred. And I'm, you know, that's what something you see in like professional athletes and yeah. Duracell. Yeah. She's not that. 
but there's a big genetic component. I was there. about to say, it's, yeah, it's definitely genetic. Huge genetic component, right? So even with her, she still needs to find her average, and on a day that is below, even though it's super high compared to others, it's still <laughs> it's still a day where you're she like, that's like a magical unicorn. I, and at first, I was like, your your ring is broken. There's no way you're <laughs> you're that much more than yeah. me. And I was comparing myself to her, but we can't do that. I think just finding that baseline and increasing it over time, and which brings me to the next thing that I want to close on here we were having this conversation about environmental factors. And I shared uh, my story about f finding mold here and the actual outdoor environment, having high amounts of hydrogen sulfide and how this is a very toxic living environment for me right now that I'm actually moving out of and how that's impacted me, how it's impacted you. And you actually have you know, a genetic SNP that makes you even more susceptible. So share a little bit more about you know, that and then why that ties into this uh, individuality that we see out there. Yeah. So, I, and I'm so sorry that you have both been, um, and Ziggy are yeah. dealing with this because this is a beautiful home. It is. Thanks, um, Cynthia. Yeah. So, so I think that I didn't realize that I was sensitive to mold and mycotoxins until I started, you know, my health started going south and, and I had been in a situation in a home that I'd been there several years, not realizing that we, we were being unknowingly exposed and so not only was it a mold, you know, mold contributor, but we also had this external radiation that was coming in from the outside. And we have a mutual friend, Brian Hoyer, uh, who came to evaluate my house because he's a friend. And the first thing he said was, I've never seen levels this high. Gosh. And I just started to cry because I think my husband thought I'd lost my mind. I was like, I'm not sleeping. Yeah. Um, I gained a bunch of weight. I just felt awful. I was really inflamed. And uh, everything that Brian recommended that we do, we changed our mattresses. We used certain kind of paint on the wall. We used, you know, uh, fabric coverings. I mean, everything that we could do that we could control. Turned off the Wi-Fi at night. And my sleep started to get better. But the honest answer was it got better when we left, mm -hmm. you know, when we left that house. And so I think for each one of us, you know, some of us are a canary in a coal mine. I'm a canary in the coal mine. I'm super sensitive to mold. Not um, everybody who's, uh, not all the young people listening understand that reference. So explain what that means, canary in the coal mine. I know. <laughs> Just so, so uh, coal miners <laughs> used to put canaries down there because the canaries, if the canaries were healthy, they could be exposed to whatever gaseous, uh, you know, fumes and toxins. And when the canary died... They knew that it was bad for them. Because so, they were super sensitive. Right, exactly. And that's you. Super sen so I'm I'm super sensitive to these kinds of things like EMF radiation, mold, mycotoxins. And so it was when we left that environment that my sleep improved substantially. Wow. That was number one. And then when we did a new build three years ago, we involved Brian to come survey the land. Smart. to Right. And so he just said, this is like perfect for mm -hmm. you. So I, I think that not everyone is sensitive to that. The area of Northern Virginia that I left called Ashburn uh, is one of the largest data center places on, in the entire oh, nation. Oh, wow. Second only to Silicon Valley. Wow. And so it is a crime that the Board of Supervisors allowed the flagrant um, building of data centers because I have no doubt that it was not just me, but many other people in a very high stress, very expensive part of the United States who have been adversely impacted by the amount of radiation that is coming off of these data centers. Like imagine, I forget what percentage of um, internet traffic comes through that area. I mean, you can imagine the amount of security. I mean, it's just insane. And they're, they're ugly, big, huge buildings. And here's yeah. this beautiful part of Northern Virginia that's now just, it's like one data center after another. So I think for every person out there, when you're digging for answers, it can be all the things we've talked about. But you have to consider that it could be beyond the normal environmental stuff that can certainly contribute. Mm -hmm. I know for myself, like I never even had EMF and radiation on my radar, but yet understanding that when you're overexposed to it, it can raise cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, okay, I'm perimenopausal. I can't sleep. I'm doing all the right things. And realizing that the home that I lived in was contributing so significantly and it was like it got better when we did all those changes, yeah. which were painful because they were all very expensive. I'm about to experience that. <laughs> and then the, the next layer was um, moving. Yeah. Because I was like, my family's health and my health is way too important. It's everything. And it was interesting. We moved into a rental two miles away. Totally different. Just two miles away, huh? Two miles away. That's crazy. Yeah. And I believe that too. Yeah. And so, so I think that 
uh, I share that experience so that if you are someone that has done all the right things, to consider that it could be something that you can't see. Yeah. That's impacting your health. I mean, certainly you're dealing with the mold and mycotoxins right now, which and I the know. out and the outdoor environment the too. Outdoor environment. It's like I can't escape, and you yeah. can't see it. You're right. I mean, yeah. the mold was not visible until Ryan Blazer came in here and showed it to me. It was hidden. But you're right. If you're doing so many things right, taking all these supplements, you're doing your keto, your fasting, your carnivore, whatever it is, and you just don't feel right. Mm -hmm. There is something probably going on in your environment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I noticed the last few months. I just didn't feel great. Yeah. And I've been through mold exposure in 2018 and some of those symptoms were creeping back. But it makes me think, I, I just can't stop thinking about this. Like if I wasn't already so healthy and if Natasha wasn't so healthy and we didn't do all the things that we did, we would be so sick right now. Yeah, absolutely. And so you think about the testament to, and the, the same thing for me, it was like, we do all the right things. So imagine how much worse off. You would have been totally debilitated. Right. And I just remember that um, when we got all that information about all the, the radiation and the EMF that came into this house, I talked to my mom and my mom was like, you have to move. You can't stay there. She's right. And you did. Yeah. I mean, the pandemic kind of shoved everything along. It was yeah. like, okay, you know, it's time to make a change for sure. But I think the other thing that's really significant, Ben, about your story is most people that are sensitive to mold, it's usually not one exposure. It's multiple exposure. It's like the toxin bucket just gets filled and filled and filled. Right. And then it topples over. And I think for me, it was fill, 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 fill. And then it was like perimenopause. And that mm -hmm. was like, Overflow. So I got kicked. I just got yeah. kicked. Uh, and so for you, I think, you know, it, you probably have some genetic susceptibility as well that it just filled and filled and filled until, but bravo to you for having the, the strength and the courage to look for answers because sometimes it's easier for us to pretend that there's not something amiss. We're like, no, things are okay. I might just be getting older. Correct. I might just be getting more tired. You yeah. Know, all the things that we That's, say. I mean, ourselves. I had those thoughts for, you know, months until I was like, no, oh, there has to be something else going on. And then I made the decision. And if you listen to the previous episode that we released with the Ryan Blazer, you could hear that story. Uh, but Cynthia, I have a, a final question for you. Uh -huh. I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded Tea. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded Tea is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one Take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, Head over to UpgradedFormulas.com, and if you use the coupon code KETOSIS at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is UpgradedFormulas.com, KETOSIS at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below, and let's get back to today's video. You know I love vitamin G. <laughs> <laughs> great for postmenopausal women, yes. great for menstruating women, great for every human being. Mm -hmm. uh, gratitude, of course, is vitamin G. What do you have gratitude for today? Oh, goodness. So I'm here in Miami with my team, my core team. A couple of them weren't able to make it, but my core team is here. And um, I met with my business coach yesterday, and we mapped out 
a, a way to get to some pretty audacious goals in 2024. And so I'm grateful for them being here with me that they, um, you know, they, they call themselves entrepreneurs. So they're entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs within my business. Love it. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have them here. And, you know, I wouldn't be where I am in my business without them. I'm also grateful that we were able to, you know, connect and record today in person. It's always good to see you. It's, I feel like it's been a while. It has been. Um, I think it was Denver the last time I saw you. Low carb Denver. Talk about eight, low HRV scores. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, the the altitude wrecked me. <laughs> I was like, man. I was like, I, my my HRV is in like the teens and the twenties. But it was hormesis because when I got back, my scores were a lot like higher than average. Yep, I just had to get it out of the altitude. So for me, those are the things I'm most grateful for. And I'm grateful for a really good Uber driver who didn't drop me off. In a, in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> in a bad neighborhood. I kept yeah. thinking, I was like, he doesn't live here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Cynthia, I'm, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful this was our fourth interview. But this one was special because it was in person here yeah. at my location. And even though you knew I had mold here, you took the hit. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's, <laughs> That's a friends true do. friend right there. That's somebody who's committed. That's friends do. Uh, grateful that we've shared the stage together. We have more stages to share together. On that note, do you have anything uh, that you're speaking at next year or anything scheduled? I heard a rumor that you and I might be speaking at an event in February together. Uh, what is in February? Costa Rica. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Oh, okay. So there's a retreat there. Uh, Dr. Ronald Vega. Yeah. And uh, okay, so he told me he was going to reach out to you. So we'll, we'll give you more details on that if you want to hang out yeah. with Cynthia and I in Costa Rica. Cynthia, I'm so happy to hear that. I know. I was like, Costa Rica? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Donald That's Vega, sure. not Ronald. I'm sorry, Donald, brother. <laughs> Donald <laughs> Vega. Uh, yeah, so there you go. And then there will be other stages we speak on. Um, For sure. Cynthia's book is called The Intermittent Fasting Transformation. You get it on Amazon, at Barnes & Nobles, at bookstores. She has an amazing YouTube channel and she's putting a lot of energy into it. So every single person who's watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, just type in Cynthia Thurlow on YouTube and go subscribe to her channel. Where else do you want them to go? Oh, I'd say come to my website and get on my newsletter. It's always a great way to stay connected. I'm active on Instagram. I'm active occasionally on Twitter where I can be a little snarky. And then I have a free <laughs> Facebook group called the Intermittent Fasting Lifestyle backslash my name, which is a free group drama laden drama free excuse me drama free zone <laughs> um there are men and women in that group but it's a great place to connect and um, that's me answering questions in that group not my team very cool we'll put all that down below until next time cynthia thank you so much for coming so to miami much. and doing this yeah absolutely